Today, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky reiterated his request for a no-fly zone over Ukraine, even though, rightly in my view, it's a non-starter for this administration. And while President Biden has been clear and consistent that measures like a no-fly zone with American jets and pilots and military equipment could escalate the Russian invasion of Ukraine into World War III, there are some people who believe he should send in the U.S. military anyway. One of them is Jamil Jaffa, the former White House associate counsel under President George W. Bush. In an op-ed for The Hill that Jaffa wrote with former U.S. General Keith Alexander, he says, quote, we should make clear that while we don't want a war, we no longer can stand by and watch Vladimir Putin kill innocent civilians. We should deploy the U.S. Air Force and hopefully those of our allies over Ukraine to stop the killing and enforce Russia's withdrawal by establishing a no-fly zone. And Jamil Jaffa joins me now. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, Congressman Michael McCall, the ranking Republican, not Democrat, Republican on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, has said that a no-fly zone over Ukraine would result in automatic World War III. Republican Senator Marco Rubio says the same. So why on earth are you still advocating for something that even top Republicans say We'll start World War Three. Well, maybe this isn't about Democrats, or Republicans. It's about what the United States, our allies, will accept in in Europe, in Ukraine. We've seen the Russians come across the border illegally. We've seen them now escalate the conflict, going after civilian targets, going after apartment buildings, going after schools, hospitals, and the like. At some point, we have to bring this conflict to a close. If we let it fester, this is only going to get worse. Vladimir Putin is already doubling down on targeting of civilians. This is likely to get dramatically worse over the next weeks and months rather than better. We have an obligation to step in, stop the killing, bring it to a halt and get a negotiated solution and get the Russians out of Ukraine. I, I agree with everything you just said, except for the setting up a no fly zone that would kick off World War Three because the Russian military and the American military would be in a hot war, in a shooting war. You cannot set up a no fly zone as everyone from General Mark Milley to General Lloyd Austin to Jens Stoltenberg, the head of NATO, pointed out, unless you take out Russian air defense systems, unless you're willing to enforce it and shoot down Russian aircraft. How would that make the situation in Ukraine better to have American aircraft shooting down Russian aircraft with Vladimir Putin sitting on the biggest nuclear arms stockpile on planet Earth? Well, the real question is, does Vladimir Putin want a shooting war with the United States? I think the answer is he does not, and neither do we. If we were to establish a no-fly zone, right, it doesn't require us to shoot down Russian aircraft unless they violate the no-fly zone. So as long as Putin is willing to engage in a negotiation once we establish this no-fly zone, right, then we can move the ball forward. Today, there is no incentive for Putin to negotiate. The president has made clear we're not going to engage, engage militarily. That means Putin can do essentially anything he wants, perhaps not going all the way to unconventional weapons, nuclear, chemical, bio. But short of that, he can essentially do anything he wants, including the ongoing target of civilians. How can that be better, Mehdi? We've got to figure out a way to bring this, this, of course, this call to no a halt. One, I understand the emotional argument. No one wants to see the scenes that we're putting up on screen right now. I'm just coming from a practical point of view. You can't have it both ways. We're told today by the president that Vladimir Putin is a war criminal. We're told he's evil. We're told he's mad. We're told that he's isolated. And yet you're telling me very confidently that if we shoot down Russian aircraft over Ukraine, he won't use even tactical nuclear weapons. How can you be so sure? Well, I think, look, I think Vladimir Putin at some level understands that he would, he would, it would, it would bring the entire world against him it would engage in a conflict that he doesn't want. He does not want to lose power in Russia. He does not want to lose his conflict. Either. He wants a negotiated solution, too. The problem is right now, there's nothing pushing us towards a resolution, right? The U.S. getting involved and saying, look, we're going to enforce discipline in this space. We're not going to let it continue to massacre civilians. That's the only thing you can bring a resolution to this. Today, the killing will only continue. Vladimir Putin has no incentive to negotiate today. The U.S. can create that incentive. Now, it's true that it might it has a possibility of escalating, right? But the fact of the matter is there is no prevention today for Vladimir Putin escalating the attacks on Ukraine. In fact, we've seen him do it. Mehdi, how do we bring this thing to a conclusion if we don't get involved I, I, at some I, level? Uh, I, I, I don't understand please. how we bring it to a conclusion by risking a nuclear war, which even you admit is a risk. Quick practical question for you. A lot of the damage being done in Ukraine is being done by Russian artillery, not by Russian uh, air force jets. Right. So a no-fly zone wouldn't even protect a lot of the Ukrainian civilians we want to protect. Well, part of the, part of the, the situation with the no-fly zone is it'll allow the Ukrainian military to have a more aggressive action against Russian forces on the ground. You're right. Some of the artillery is based outside of Ukraine, long-range artillery. That's a separate problem, right, and one that we have to figure out a way to deal with. But at least in the short run, establishing a no-fly zone 
provides a dramatic benefit to the Ukrainian military that's already fighting heroically without the necessary weapons they need. We should have given them weapons long ago, a lot more. Yes, now we, we put 200 million or put another 800 million. Now, I think this is a lot too late, Manny. I think giving weapons is very different from attacking Russians. One last quick question. Joe Biden called Vladimir Putin a war criminal today. Back in 2001, when President George W. Bush met with Putin, he said this. Have a listen. I looked the man in the eye. I found it to be very straightforward and trustworthy. And we had a very good dialogue. I was able to um, get a sense of his soul. The man deeply committed to his country and the best interests of his country. Uh, and I appreciate it so very much, the frank dialogue. You worked for President Bush. He was one of many American leaders who got played by Vladimir Putin, was he not? He thought he was a reformer, trustworthy, looked at his soul. I think President Bush would admit he was wrong about that, just like President Obama would admit he was wrong to whisper to Vladimir Putin, hey, you know, give me a little room, just like President Trump. Well, he might not admit he was wrong, but he was wrong, too, when he said he trusted Vladimir Putin over his intelligence community. And President Biden, thinking against all odds that economic sanctions would keep Vladimir Putin away from Ukraine, I think he'd have to admit today, too, he was wrong. We should just all acknowledge we've gotten Vladimir Putin wrong. Now's the time he respects and understands strength, maybe. We have not shown that. President Biden needs to show strength. That will bring this conflict yeah. to resolution. Not given, allowed to fester. Given, allowed to massacre civilians. Given we all got Vladimir Putin wrong, maybe we shouldn't confidently declare that he won't use nukes. Uh, Jamil Jaffa, thank you for coming on the show and debating this. Appreciate it. Thanks, man. Appreciate Next, you. While the right